been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of exposure four. Got fire through the roof of the fire area in the entire rear section. Now remember, given the payday, has entered accounted for. Okay. 610B, now is the day date, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. Hang up to the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows centered below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we use it all here. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary switches are underway. Hey, welcome back to our fire engineering podcast, The Command Post, back here once again at fireengineering.com. Um, our, our, our great... Uh, uh, teammates and great hosts and great organization. Um, I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my best buddy, Chief John Salka. And John, we're right in the middle of grading proposals for FDIC International for next year, for 2024. And as always, there's some great submissions. I know you're always talking about the next all-stars and getting you know the, the next ones in there that uh, have something. The next generation, the next generation of instructors. That's right. They're on their way. They're They're rising. Well, and how many times have you been somewhere and you call me and you're talking about someone who's teaching a program and you're like, God, this this guy or this gal did such a great job. They should be at FDIC. They should be teaching. They should be out, you know, whatever. And uh, there's some people that have some great stuff to offer. Yep. Yep. So, and then the small guys are all like us. <laughs> all three of us, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, and so we've got, we've got uh, as a reminder, several great seminars coming up. If you're interested in attending, um, I post all of them that John and I do together at my website calendar at chieflasky.com. So that's got all the contact information if you're interested. We've also got uh, several more company officer academies and some of our uh, chief officer field train academies, a.k.a. the Battalion Chiefs Academy. Uh, so if you're interested, again, in either of those, uh, give us a shout. We'll get you lined out. That'll be either with us or with Columbia Southern University CSU, another great partner of ours. But, uh, folks, we've got a, a great guest with us today, another great difference maker. We love the difference makers in the fire service, um, especially those that have committed not just uh, – uh, a career, but their life to making a difference. But today, our special guest is, is Tom Shannon. And Tom, welcome, buddy. Thanks very much, Chief. Appreciate it. Oh, no, we we love having you on here, John. So, you know, John and I, was, a lot of times we do these shows just by ourselves, and once in a while, we'll have a guest on. And it's usually for like this particular reason. It's like, you know, we're having a conversation. John says, I got it. You know what? We, we need to have this guy on. This, you know, and, and, and it's been probably. Oh God! Over a year since we've had a guest with us, John, at least or whatever. Yeah, been a while, um, right? And uh, we've had some substitutes when one of us is tied up or something like that. But John's like, you know, we we have to have my buddy Tom. So Tom came out and he goes through this whole rendition of what they're doing with their new apparatus and and all that stuff and so on and so forth. And um and talking about you know the, the do's and the don'ts from his end. And we, we you know we've done some shows before Tom about you know specking your rig and doing you know stop. Stop trying to to buy a rig that looks like an FDNY or Chicago rig when you're not in the New York, New York City or Chicago. Spec the rig for your needs and what you have. You want it to look like it, that's fine. But you know, you know, and and, and sadly, there's the, a lot of times there's a lot of chiefs, good guys and gals that are the ones specking the rig and they don't even ride it anymore. And you end up with something that the guys like, why is this on here? Why is this done this way? And so on and so forth. And then and then there, there's so many bits and pieces of the process. Um, I guess the frustrating part, Tom, is, uh, uh, you know, they order this, this new rig, then they miss out very, some very, very, very critical steps like the final inspection. We'll talk to that and then delivery and service training, but there's so many things. So that, that's what we wanted, we wanted to get to, but before we do that um, for our, for our listeners um, uh, and, and again, there'll be a lot of people that'll be, that'll be following up on this later on. Tell us a little bit about you. Start us, you, you mentioned before we went live, like John and I, we both, like me, I went, I was going to fires with my dad when I was literally in diapers. I mean, going to calls and going to the firehouse. Let's start with young Tom and bring us all the way to where you're at today. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess if you haven't had a, a guest on in o over a year, I'm uh, certainly more than honored to share <laughs> whatever information we can. 
So uh, I guess real quick. So I, I was uh, born and raised in Pearl River, New York. My dad was a volunteer firefighter on uh, Sundays after church. I was the oldest of uh, three kids at the time. Uh, in order to give my mom a break, my dad would take uh, my next youngest brother and I down to the fire station where typically they did housework, uh, you know, clean the rigs up, uh, would go out, do driver training. So I, literally at the age of six years old, I got put in the front seat of a 1949 Peter Persh ladder truck. My father would go out on a road test, take it up to the local Sunoco station, which was owned by the fire company captain, fuel it up. And, and I just thought, man, this has got to be the greatest thing in in, in the world. Uh, very early on, as the parades were pretty common in, in southern New York, my grandfather was a real photography buff, and I would kind of tug on grandpa's uh pants or shirt to say, hey, grandpa, can you take a picture of, of that fire truck? So as a youngster, I had slides of fire trucks taken from parades. Uh, and it, as I went through parochial school, uh, the nuns, uh, when it came parent teacher night, told my mom and dad, I was always curious, the nuns, even if you were a good student, and I, you know, I, I was, a you know, maybe B to B minus, but, but not a cut up, you know, so I didn't, wasn't worried about the nun blowing me in for something I did inappropriately or said something, but she told both of my parents from, from seventh and eighth grade on, don't worry about sending him to high school or college because he just wants to be a fireman. And it's a waste of money. Firemen don't need to go to a good school. Uh, so I, I was blessed for early on. I knew I wanted to go to the University of Maryland and uh, it was probably the, the, the foundation and starting point of my career from 1970 to 1973 to be a student bunker at College Park Fire Department in Prince George's County, Maryland, uh, was mentored by just fantastic folks up and down the line. When I look at it, it's the, again, like a lot of things in life, as things are happening and unfolding, you don't really appreciate the situation you're in un, until you look back on them later and you look at what those people did in their career and how that impacted me. So as I tell folks to this day, you fast forward, I spent 32 years working in the apparatus industry uh, in both sales and engineering positions. Uh, just had been had a career that's been blessed beyond belief. And when I take my lovely wife, Jackie, out with me and we go uh, take pictures of fire trucks, she says, so what do you tell these guys? I said, I'm just an old guy that's a fire truck nut. I just have never outgrown <laughs> it. You know? uh, I guess the last thing, uh, I want to get, get the pitch in for this. Uh, from 2011 to 2022, uh, I work with both Navy and Marine Corps, Fire and Emergency Services, two separate organizations, uh, and assisted them with developing the specifications for all their apparatus fleet which included doing the specs, the bid reviews, pre-construction conferences, what we're going to talk about today, final inspections, and then the follow-up work to make sure that as each installation got the rig that, you know, uh, all the items that we identified at the final inspection were taken care of so the brothers and sisters could get the rig and get it, get it placed in the service. So, uh, again, I've had a career, uh, Chief Lasky and, and Chief Salko, just blessed beyond belief. Uh since the late 1990s, I first got introduced to my business partner at Emergency Vehicle Response, Lieutenant, retired Lieutenant Mike Wilbur from FDNY. And that happened at a, at a national conference when a uh, friend who was chief of the Syracuse Fire Department, uh, Mike uh, Mark McLeese, said, would you like to meet Mike Wilbur? And I'm like, the Mike Wilbur, who's who's a noted author, and he introduces him to me. And, and the hometown where I grew up, there was a bunch of FDNY guys that I rubbed elbows with over the years. So as a youngster, I always had this vision as to what an FDNY engine man looked like versus an FDNY truck man. There were a couple of FDNY guys that were in ladder companies in my dad's volunteer fire company. And and they they were they would to me they were almost like this Jim Brown cast in bronze, you know, just hulking figure could could walk through a wall. They didn't need to open it up. You need the, the, the roof open up, chief, not a problem. You know, just give me give me an ax and an eight-foot hook and, and we're good. And when I got introduced to Lieutenant Wilburn, I said, let me get this straight. You're an officer in a ladder company? Really? Just based on your stature? So uh, I, I'm like the engine geek, and that's it's kind of been my forte. And so Mike and I, we hit it off. We're like the Abbott and Costello. We're the odd 
odd couple of fire truck folks, just based on our backgrounds and and where our voc- respective vocations took us. Well, and you mentioned two guys that John and I talk about a lot. I mean, how many times have we talked about Mark McLeese, two, our, two of our good friends, and Mike guy. Wilbur? Yep. Oh my God, we, we I mean, you know, so uh, I already love you uh, hanging out with with. I mean, again, two two great, 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 great people. But I got to go back to stuff. So you know, obviously, we're both we're we're both fire buffs, and I've got my museum, and I've got my stuff. Do you still have the old pictures that that your dad? I mean, I, you know, those old. So many people are throwing away their history, or boxes of pictures or slides before they get them transferred into print are gone forever. Do you still have some of those pictures of those rigs? Yeah, Chief Lasky, I still got some Kodak thirty five millimeter slides that my grandfather took oh, when, God. When, when when I was a youngster. What's the oldest rig? What's the old What's the oldest rig? I know we're going off topic, John, but I got to oh, ask oh, you. You mean the oldest rig that I have? A in a picture. photo, in a photo. What's the oldest rig oh, you have? Pro- pro- probably like a, a late 30s or early 40s vintage, you know, Aaron Aaron's Fox. Uh, I, as a youngster, I throw this out. And you, you probably, again, with the Internet has taken all of this away. But uh, when when my hometown fire company, where my, that my dad uh, volunteered, when they went to buy an engine in 1957, I woke up one morning before going to school and here was a whole bunch of fire truck literature just sitting on my bed as I woke up to go to school that night when my dad came home from work. uh, I said, dad, where'd this stuff come from? He goes, oh, that stuff, you know, that they accumulated and I thought you might like it. So it kind of really piqued my interest. And I started handwriting letters to Seagrave fire apparatus when they were in Columbus, Ohio, to Max Motors and, in in Middleborough, even Crown out on the West Coast, as a little kid and said, could you please send me some pictures and literature of fire trucks? And they used to send stuff. I have that stuff in my collection to this day. Oh, and it's just so, so I've, you know, I've got like, like I said, a ton of stuff, uh, pre-Civil War all the way up and at, and some of my favorite books are are like Fire in America by by a guy named Lyons in the 70s, where it takes us from, you know, Jamestown all the way forward. You have pictures of Benjamin Franklin's helmet? I got pictures of me and Benjamin Franklin. So there you go. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and one of them, one of them is, uh, what we talk about is the romance of firefighting by a guy, a guy named Holzman, H O Z M O N. And it's his 1950s Tom edition. And the very last section of the book, after he walks you through buckets and horses and front pieces and helmets and all that stuff, he gets all the way to the point. He's got a, like a 1954, American La France pumper. And he actually refers to it. Take a look at, 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 at like this new pumper in the fo- in photo below with its new fangled gauges and knobs and everything. And John, you say it back then that was the most advanced technology in the world in the regarding world. fire That's engines. Right. Yep. You know, this 1954, you know, and then you look at where we're at today, Tom, and go, and again, 1954 wasn't that long ago. There was rigs before that. So I was asking about the pictures. But Chief, it's interesting you mentioned that book. That was one of the first fire truck books that I got, I forget, as a birthday <laughs> or Christmas present. I think I probably slept and put that under my my, my pillow. <laughs> right? There, there you go. Great. Oh, there is Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So in, in Holtzman's book, real quick, there was a picture of a rig that he had miscaptioned based on what make it was. So I'm pointing this out to my my father, and he goes, you really think you know more than the guy who wrote the book? I'm like, Dad, he's identifying this thing as a Ward La France. You can clearly make out it's a Peter Persh. He goes, well, if, you're, if, if you think he's wrong, he says, write him a letter, all right? <laughs> so I, I wrote Holtzman a letter, right? Telling him I enjoyed the book, I love it. I said, but I, you know, detailed the, the whatever page it was. I said it, that rig is miscaptioned. It's really a Peter Purse. So he wrote me back and said, "Well, I really appreciate it." He said, "I only had negatives." You think about publishing back then. I only had negatives to work off of, and that's the information that the person who sent it to me said it was a Ward of France. So I just left it at that. So when I showed oh, my cool. father the letter, he goes, eh. "He goes." I'm glad you I'm glad you didn't think you were a smart ass, you know, for the publisher to tell us tell him that you know he put the wrong caption in the book. So l- later on in life, you know, I've been again blessed. I I, I did a uh, did books with the iconographic series, uh, 
co-authored the book with the late Leo DeLiba, who was a great friend on on young fire apparatus, did, did a book with iconographics on uh, on Han, and then partnered up twice with the retired uh, Deputy Chief Dave Reeves from Syracuse and did uh, did a Syracuse book. And that was really just having spent so many years living up in that area, uh, watching Chief McLeese go through the ranks from a probationary firefighter. I said, you tell me, you know, Mark, who was the smart guy? We graded Syracuse together when we both worked for ISO, all right, after he came up from New York City. That's right. They were class one, right? Right. I said, so who was the smart guy in the dummy here? You went on a job in Syracuse, rose through the ranks and, and, and came out as chief of department. I said, what am I doing? I'm still playing with red fire trucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark is one of – he. And, in fact, the, the similarities between him and Mike Wilbur – I think you could set a bomb off next to them and they would, I mean, they're the, some of the two of the calmest dudes. You'll yeah. just, I mean, their, their mannerisms, their, their, their on scene demeanors, everything. There's no screaming. No, they just, they're like, you know, even keel. They're just, they're awesome that way. But so let me, let me throw this at you. you we're, we start talking. I'm glad we, you, we brought up uh, Holzman's book um, and old apparatus. All right. And and John, I say this all the time. It's like when, when you know. Unfortunately, I mean, I I put the first writ bag together years ago, and I remember Diane from Fire Engineer go, "You need to do an article." And I go, "Diane, it's a bag." Because yeah, but she, well, John, you and I have seen this how many times, thousands of times. The original writ bag was never designed to be what it is today, with like sledgehammers and bowling balls and boat anchors and all. And they're so cumbersome. But at the same time, a firefighter didn't come in and say, "Hey." You know, hey, Chief, I got a great way of how to screw up a, a writ bag. Let's a little overload it with crap. And nobody came in and said, I have a great way on how to screw up a Mayday. Right in the middle of a Mayday, let's change channels. They they were good, I think, uh, progressive thinking contributors that want to make a difference. Fire apparatus, I think we went from a time where, you know, we can get to this, hose beds were lower and reachable and this and that and so on and so forth. To where we start building these things that you needed an aerial ladder to get to the top of the pumper because they were so they were just they were just built so and now we're we're slowly I think we're getting back where we're listening and we're building hose beds that are lower and we can get to them now. Technology's brought that and so on and so forth. I think you're starting to see a, 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 I don't know what you call it, full circle where I don't know if we're listening better to the to the people like yourself and the troops that are saying we need something a little bit easier to work with, but before we even get down the path of of even a final inspection, are you seeing that where we're starting to we're starting to get back to being a little I don't want to, more functional with the apparatus from deck guns you can't get to or that don't have gate valves in them to hose beds that are lower now? Are you starting to see that more in your in your business? Yeah, absolutely, Chief. And a real, real, really good point. You know, obviously, I've all three of us we've been around enough to know what rigs look like. You know, when we came into the service, uh, when there was not nearly as many options or configurations of, available on rigs, certainly from an overall perspective, I think technology really changed in the late 80s into the 90s when engines and transmissions first went from being me all mechanical, you know, operated to having electronics. And then that rolled over into, you know, pump controls and governors and things like that. So you had a whole generation of not only users, but people that were selling the rigs and designing the rigs that were accustomed to having as much, much hands-off and electronic push-button technology as, as was available. And when combined with the fact of shrinking of staffing in a lot of departments, where a standalone, as I call it, a straight ladder truck, you know, it was an aerial device of some point, but it didn't have a pump and tank on it. It had truck stuff and a lot of ground ladders. The introduction or, or, or having quints become the predominant style of aerial device. And then on the engine side, no matter what size the department is, career or volunteer, people say, hey, you know, the days we can no longer daytime staffing, we can't get out an engine and a rescue truck. What are we going to do? We're going to buy a rescue engine. So we're going to take rescue stuff. We're going to make it you know, it's going to look like a toolbox on wheels. And when you go back and take the pulse of people, as I call it, 
about month 24 to 32, after the warranty's worn off and everybody's, it's got a couple of scratches. Nobody's afraid to go tell the chief, hey, psst, by the way, when we backed in, we did, we ding the, you know, the, the, the corner of the station. Don't worry. We didn't damage the station. Just a little wrinkle in the tread plate. We'll bang it out. Nobody need no, no report needed that people will, to a person will tell you it's, it's not really a good engine and it's not really a good, a, a, a good, good rescue. And with that, when we have full height, full depth compartments, what happens? The water tank goes from an L tank or a T tank to it's now a shoe box. The hose bed goes up in the air. And as I tell folks, you know, even if, you know, if you're not, you're not running, you know, a couple thousand calls a year and typical, you know, Maryland or Virginia term laying out, we're laying out on every right. reported structure fire. We're dropping a line in the street. Every mm -hmm. once in a while, when you have to take that LDH and have to go load it, you're going to find out it's pretty, it, it's not very user friendly to climb 88 inches in the air to get in the hose bed to get up there. And maybe you got up there, try coming down in bunker gear or coming down in bunker gear at night, even though all the, step, <laughs> all the steps are illuminated and try doing that. So that's one of the things Wilbur and Shand, when we go out, FDIC or shows, you know, unless the back of the rig's taped off, I'll say, Mike, hold my camera and my glasses for a second. I'll climb up and down the rig and people come up like, you know, you're interested, like you're a prospective buyer. Can I help you? Now, I'm just looking to see how difficult it is to climb up this rig if there's not an access ladder on the back and figuring out if I can't do it safely in street clothes when it's well illuminated. I'm thinking it's probably not too damn safe when I'm in bunker pants, you know, trying to rack a line and pick up after a job. Well, and that goes back to, and John, you and I have talked about this. It, Tom, I tell this story quite often. Um, you know, we're on the road. People always want to go, hey, can we show you the firehouse, show you our rigs? And, you know, we're like, oh, yeah. And sometimes you go, okay, it's another pumper. And I remember, and I wish I had taken a picture of it. I tell this story, and John, you know where I'm going with this. So this guy showed me his pumper, and he opens up this little this little compartment on the side. And inside, there's a little miniature Halligan tool. And a little mallet, and I go, what, 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 what are those? He goes, those, those are irons. I go, no, 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 those, those are not irons. That is no, no. Uh, is that like the little firefighter comes out and does it? What? It, I said, where, where, where's the full size? He goes, well, they're up in the well. I go, why not here? He goes, well, they don't fit in a compartment. I go, well, who specked out this rig? And they go, chief did. I go, the guy that doesn't ride it, specked out the rig. Now, I always say this time. I go, there are a lot of departments, like my volunteer department. You know, my chief, Ryan Fetzer, has to be involved. Very, very smart guy. Very guy, has the background. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, sometimes the most educated and most experienced person is the chief, especially on maybe a volley department or whatever that has to be involved in the committee. But sometimes there's some of these guys that won't let go and involve a, a true committee or um, or the people. So, I mean, I, and we just lost this guy, Tom. And, and John, you've heard me talk about John, Captain John Ashman, Chief John Ashman for years. Uh John, John Boy, he's from originally from Pennsylvania. He was one of my guys in Louisville. Uh, the 12 years I spent as chief there, million, they keep their engines at tower lights for 10 years and they go away. Reserve stats, whatever. Ambulances are five, cheese cars are six. Spent millions and pounds, millions about millions of dollars. I've never respected the rig. I always turned to John and said, you know, John Ashman, John Boy, go take care. We call him John Boy. But the only thing I told him was, you must talk to the guys. Ask the guys what we can't do everything, but talk to them, ask them about. And you mentioned getting up on top of the rig, you know, the hazmat station, they want bigger paddles to be able to get up there because there's things they have to get off the top versus the station that has the dive team. These, you know, the front of the rigs all look the same, but there's different things about each one because the guys had input and said, we really need this or can you do this or whatever. And that's the only thing Tom ever said was make sure you talk to the troops to the guys who are ride the rigs every day and tell them, be honest, tell me what, what don't you like about what we have on our pumpers right now? And let's see if we can make an adjustment. Um, I know you have to see that when you travel and I'm not knocking like chiefs. I'm just saying there's a lot of chiefs that design firehouses and you look at it and go, nobody asked the troops about where the day I was in a firehouse where the day room kitchen and, and, um, uh, 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 the, well, the day room kitchen and uh, dining room were not even connected to the to the fire. You had the firehouse. You had to run down a hallway past the mops of rooms <laughs> through a radio room to the back of the firehouse because the chief designed it and didn't ask the guys, how can we get out to the apparatus bay the quickest? Where do we need to put this? 
Do you st- I mean, are we? Do you still see that? Where sometimes I'll, I'm not going to say the wrong people, but they go I, they go about it all wrong. They don't involve the people who are riding the rigs for suggestions. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's one item, Chief. I think the the other more poignant item that that Mike and I have found over the years is the physical the size of the committee, the number of people on the Too committee. Many people. And yeah, when it when it gets to, to be much above six, maybe seven, depending on their vocation and, and and how into it they are, it just becomes unwieldy. So when you see these multifaceted, uh, Mike calls it, they check the box on every option, you know, <laughs> and, you, and you start asking them how many people were on the committee, and you can see that just everybody particularly in a volunteer organization, not to knock them, because that's where I spent most of my career. Uh, it was just too many people that, uh, the dad's old expression, too many cooks spoil the broth, right? Everybody got what they wanted. And then when you look at it, it it's not a very functional anything. And, and Chief Lask, going to go back to your point. When I'm out visiting fire stations or taking pictures, one of my favorite comments uh, that I'll hear from the crew if we get the rig outside to get a position in the sun and get some pictures. And I'll start opening up compartments because I'm curious how they have their tools and equipment. And after the second or third door that you open or you know, and close, somebody on the crew will go, hey, Tom, if you're looking for a rescue tool or something, we don't carry that. This is just an engine. All right. And with that, we'll roll around the back a look at the hose bed and I'll pull out my little Joe Friday notebook and say, can you give me the rundown on your attack on your hose load left to right? And and you can see it's a, it's a working fire truck. People weren't trying to take a basic functioning unit, be it an engine or a truck and turn it into this, you know, five or six way Swiss army knife that doesn't really do anything very well. And, you know, one of my, one of my jokes is, it's a great looking rig for me to take a picture of. I don't ever tell the fire department this, but it only probably does one thing real well. Go down Main Street or Broadway straight for the 4th of July or Memorial Day parade. <laughs> Other than that, you ain't getting this around in the first due area. And yep. again, m- many times, uh, a lot of committees, uh, this I think it's all has to do, Chief Lasky, go to, to, to your comment about the guys in gals, the brothers and sisters that ride the rig, have a conception as small as some of it. these items might be, is what works for them and what is a really good idea versus a really bad idea. And most of those people are pretty darn good at spatial relationships, uh, particularly if it's an engine crew, because if if they've got to estimate backstretches right, at, at the scene of an incident, they can cons- they can look at a blueprint and conceptualize what a 28 foot fire truck looks like versus a 34 foot fire truck. And there's a lot of times I've gone out on final inspections. And when you come into the bay where the rigs presented to the group and you the first couple of expressions will be holy, you know what, or, Oh my God. And I'm like, is that a, Oh my God, good. Or, Oh my good, bad. And it'd be like, we didn't think the thing was going to look that big right. because they could not conceptualize on an 11 by 17 print and look at the dimensions to see that your hose bed is 92 inches in the air. I've had people say, Oh, that's not bad. And then we'll go out and we'll take a break. We'll take measure what they have on the bays and go, it's 18 inches higher than the worst thing in your fire station. Are you really on a mission to make this rig less user-friendly and less unsafe? And there's honestly been a couple of times I could tell after the first night, a combination, if there's nobody on a committee within two to two and a half generations of me, no matter how good we are in communication, we can be on TAC channel 11. We ain't going to communicate very well because my experiences and background are different than the 20 and 30 somethings. God bless them because they are the future of the fire service. But a lot of these folks don't are not able to conceptualize physical size and dimensions. And sometimes we've just, we've chalked it out on the apparatus floor. Here's the rig you're replacing. I'm making this up and it's 372 inches long. What you're proposing on paper is 18 inches longer. Here's where 18 inches takes you in the apparatus bays. And then you might have somebody go, oh my God, the guys, the gear lockers behind those guys are going to have a tough time gearing up. Well, maybe the rig's too big. 
How about and those that, by, that that do the rigs and they find out they don't fit? How many times we have the three of us oh, heard that yeah, where they don't they yeah. can't fit them in the firehouse? Yep, uh, and and that happens. Rigs that don't fit, Chief Lasky and Chief Salka, and rigs when we talk about final inspection, rigs that are overweight. Once you get them in service, they are much more common and prevalent than anyone is going to admit. Well, and one of the things you know, I mean, we're always cautious about this because there's. There's a lot of great manufacturers out there. And I know you and Mike, and you guys deal with everybody, not just one brand. Your your job is to come out and help people with whatever they need, make it work, you know, from specking it to, you know, uh, I mean, we all have our, our particulars, you know, if you ask somebody on the side, which rig do you like, but a lot of great manufacturers and, and we don't ever bash one or the other when we're on the shows, but that's how I was getting at it, it, the whole, because you're stuck with this. You're spending Three something on maybe a a, a a commercial chassis to almost a million dollars now on a pumper alone that you're going to have, you know, Louisville's a great, great city. I love it. They do great things. They're very fortunate. They run the wheels off their rigs, so they get rid of them 10 years. But, you know, there's some of these departments have to keep 20 years. That's a, that's, that's a career. That's a lifetime for people. And it's very hard to go back and change something. You can't put an addition on an engine like you would your house because you're out of room or, you know, you're stuck with that rig, right? You're, I mean, this is so the specking, the 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 you know the midway point, the final inspection, all those things, right, Tom? Are they're just so absolute? The whole package is so critical because now you've got this thing. Like you said it perfectly. Yeah, a year from now, when the newness has wore off, the guys go, yeah, it's a good rig, but man, if we had to do it again, we wouldn't do this, or we would have added this. Because you're stuck with this thing forever. And and that's why I know you believe in it. It's your business. And John, I talk about this all the time. God, you take the time to do it right. Because once you get it and you sign and you're done, there's no, well, we don't like this. I mean, you could say it, but you're stuck with it for 20 years. And and yeah. we see rigs now. We go, who, 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 who put this here? Or the guys hate it. And I'm like, why do you hate it? it it's a great manufacturer. Don't blame them. They built what you wanted or what you guys asked for. So I mean, huge. Yeah, yeah. And and chief to go uh to go to that point, it, it's it's even more important now for the following reason. And and, and we're not laying blame here with anybody, but be you know, post pandemic with uh the lead times that are involved with from the time you sign a contract, wh- whatever your preferred vendor. Preferred what are we looking vendor, at now? What are we time wise, real quick? It it go at at a minimum it's it's 20 it's 24 months all right and in some cases on certain rigs it's it's 40 months plus so the amount of time of i call it sweat equity whether it's a career fire department or volunteer fire department the amount of time that it's going to take from the time you sign the contract and back in the good old days it used to be 60 to 90 days you would be at the manufacturer's facility to do a pre-construction conference now it can be a year or a year plus. I'm working with several departments that ordered a unit uh, back last February or March, and we're yet to get a date for when we're going to do pre-construction conference. So one thing is you got to let's hope the committee, everybody in tune with what what we decided we wanted a year and a half ago. All right, my, my you know, and I tell people, I said it's really important. You got to bring along the same people that designed this rig. The pre-construction and make sure they're tuned up and and are familiar with the proposal. Well, I said, and, and let me interrupt for one second there because you brought something up I don't want to miss out on. Have you seen it before where the, a chief is trying to appease the big committee? Like I said, I agree with you. We, sometimes we committee ourselves to death with like nine guys on a committee that just booger it all up and get landlocked. But anyway, where they have a certain group spec it and then they have the first group makes the trip to wherever – and for pre-construction, and then the you know halfway through they go well. Let's fly up. Let's give John and Rick and Tom a chance to go up there. And three totally different guys go up to do like this. And then there's different people that do the final. Instead, how important is it to have? And maybe I'm all wet on this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it how important is it to have the same people start and see it through? I would think you would miss some things if the same people aren't watching, right? Oh, oh, absolutely, Chief. And again, that that's another reason. Say, when you look at the size of the committee, if if you've got an overblown committee, all right, of ten or twelve people, 
un- unless you've got more money than the good Lord, all right, and you're we're passing the collection plate the third time on Sunday, you you legitimately you, I, again this is Tom Shan speaking. I don't think it's reasonable to take taxpayers' funds to go send twelve people to go do an inspection. All right, you got to you got to send the most important four, five, six folks to go out to do that, and they need to be able to see the whole process through start to finish. If you change up even one or two of those folks, at some point, the pre-construction conference or the final inspection is going to end up, you know, not going well because people, if they haven't been involved in the process and Mike, both Mike and I have, have dealt with folks on this at the final inspection, they think we can still change stuff, you know, and we're just not talking about small things like you open up compartment number three, left rear compartment and decide, Hey, I need one more shelf. Okay, understand the manufacturer wants to ship that rig and get it out to the dealership. That shelf that maybe costs two hundred and thirty dollars at pre-construction, the manufacturer is going to charge you five hundred dollars now because it's because it's holding up his his production line. That's not the time to decide. You look at it, and I've had a couple of folks look and go. Man, we really don't like the way that uh, two tone cab. We don't really like the way that paint break line is going across, uh, you know, in front of the windshield. We saw one, you know, out on the floor, and we like that. Can we change that? That's that's you know, you you signed for this thing as is, as it was contracted for, and as you changed it pre construction. And getting people to understand that is one issue. The bigger issue that I see, and it's going to be more problematic for the manufacturers, is now because in some cases, it's been three years since we signed a contract on this. Right, if right. You're a, if you're a fleet, if you're the FDNY, or you're like uh, you know Ricky Riley up in Prince George's County, or, or Deputy Chief Rice in D.C., and you've got a standard design, we're not reinventing the wheel year to year. We're just making minor running changes as models change on warning lights and things like that. But if you're if you haven't bought a fire truck in three or four years, number one, you're going to be shocked as to how the process goes now because of how long the lead times are. How about 10 years or 20 years? Some of these guys haven't ordered a rig, you know, some of the smaller departments. Absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. So, again, I, I'm not doing this, you know, from from a self-promotion standpoint. But when you go out to do the final inspection, because the industry has a lot of work, God bless them. Prices are at an all-time high. I didn't don't think ever in my lifetime a regular run-of-the-mill custom chassis pumper from anybody is going to start at nine hundred thousand, and it doesn't take too long to get you over a million dollars. And an aerial device without a fire pump, straight truck, no matter who builds it, what kind of height or length, is one point five to just under two million, and any kind of aerial platform tower tower ladder is well over two million dollars so unless you have a committee that's that's got a mechanic all right an evt certified mechanic somebody that works on this stuff one of the things that one of the people i learned the most off of in my entire career was when we went out to do navy inspections we would bring out somebody from navy fire and emergency services Myself, I was a contractor. We would bring one or two people in for the installation, and we would bring in our EVT mechanic from Navy Region, Mid-Atlantic, that came out of Norfolk. And that gentleman, David and I, we learned so much from one another because I would look at it and say, okay, it meets the spec. It's operationally, it's it's okay. We're going to test it, road test it, pump test it, whatever. David would look at it and go, what happens if I need to get access to it and it's now blocked by two other components? And we would bring that up to the manufacturer and he'd be like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You, 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 can't, you can't get off. You can't get off the uh, the uh, the brake, the brake system, some of the brake system components without taking the battery part, battery box off and half apart. And it would be that interchange that then it would help me to be able to tune up the specifications for the next round. We would then take pictures. If if I'm a firm believer, the old ad, pictures worth a thousand words. I can write a spec that can be a hundred pages long, but I'm relying upon a human being on the other side of the transom from the manufacturing world 
to try to interpret what that verbiage says. So when we were trying to describe, for example, our rear hose bed arrangement on a Navy pumper and how the uh, hose bed netting was attached and how we wanted the hose bed dividers, we put a picture in there. It was non-denominational. It didn't show who built it with the manufacturer's nameplate. We were, you know, had some discretion there. But this is what how we want the front bumper hose wells to look like. This is how we want the pump panel to look at. So in addition to the verbiage, you would have a picture in there, and then that would help guide you through pre-construction. When well, you get – go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, let me throw – I want to ask John a quick question uh, because it's going to go back to something you, you mentioned a little while ago. Um, John, you guys, you know, I always brag on Sal Blooming Grove, your volunteer department. All the years with the FDNY, you had people like Tom said that, you know, you're just you're ordering rigs and back and forth and so on and so forth. That just about everything you could think of apparatus wise, but committee wise, and you've 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 been able to see this great guys in your area. Not even picking on South Blooming Grove because you have some great people. Do you feel? And I've seen this before, John, where. I think, and I don't mean in a bad way, there's a little bit of intimidation when you take someone who's never ordered a fire engine before, let's just do a fire engine, no, not ladder, and you bring them to a manufacturer, they walk in and they see everything and they, they get in there and and it's all, it's like the car dealership where the, the, guy, the salesman comes out, tells you a few things, then they go in the back room and have coffee, just giving you some time to, you know, and, and they know if they come out there a couple of times, you're there. Is there, I mean, have you seen it with your guys where, there's a little bit of intimidation. You get there because I'm, I'm, these guys have never specked out a fire and just their first time they get there. And, and I don't know if it's they don't know what questions to ask. Maybe they're a little nervous where I used to watch John Ashman and Edgar Covey Louisville. Edward get a creep. Edgar, EVT master, like you said, Tom, he'd get on a creeper. He would be everywhere. He'd look, he'd be measured. Talking, no, this ain't whatever, you know, and some manufacturers hate that. And some of them enjoy this. Some of them are like, okay, because that's just going to get them more business because if they correct something, you know what I'm saying? They show that there's a teamwork. But John, did you see that with where some of the yeah. guys might have been a little bit intimidated? And, and, and you know, Tom has seen it and you've seen it. You, you were a fire chief. You had, you specked out rigs for years in different departments. Uh, I must tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm the least experienced. If your house is on fire, please call me. I got that down pretty good. But specking rigs out and and final inspections and all the other aspects of of setting off on the road to buy a new rig, I have very very little. I have absolutely no experience with it, other than we did it one time just recently, just just finished the process. And and other than that, I have very little experience. Now on our group, we had a six person group. There were two of the guys that were on it were past chiefs that had sat on a committee earlier for a rig ten ten years earlier, so they had a little experience with it. But you know what? In the end, and, and Tom, let me know if you agree with me. In the end, this is just like going to Raymore and Flanagan for a new furniture set, or this is just like going to Ford for a new pickup truck or anywhere else. You know what? You get wooed. You get wooed by the by the salespeople, by the shiny new rigs on a beautiful carpeted or, or polished tile floor. You know, they, they put the Cadillac out there with all the best chrome on it and all the best devices and stuff like that. And the average guy, the average person, and, and I have to pick on volunteers a little bit. And I don't mean pick on them negatively at all, but there's certainly way more volunteer departments than Korea all over the country. They're certainly buying, I would think, Tom, you would correct me, they're certainly buying more rigs than, than Korea departments. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably pre pre pandemic, Chief, probably yeah. probably the case right now. That that that's I'm not sure that I could accurately answer that question because with how far out the manufacturing the lead times are a lot of the career departments, as, as I call it, the fleet users have, have, have bought, have bought stuff and have things on order now, because if they were used to, I think straightforward analogy, they used to buy for example, four engines and two trucks every year it was pre-programmed in the budget, but you go to order four and two. Now the engines are going to show up in maybe month 30 or 32. The trucks aren't going to show up for 40 40 months. So people have pre-bought to just get their names on the list. All right. But you're right. Probably in, uh, under normal conditions based, you know, save a year that uh, FDNY and, and Los Angeles city or county, some of the you know three largest fleet users don't have major buys or builds out there. Yeah. If you were to, you know, 
go down the the, the road probably a, you know a, a lot more combination or all vo- all volunteered departments and for those folks the final inspection is even more critical because if you don't have experience which is fine it's great to bring someone we've ha- we've got to mentor the younger the younger generation along at right, some point right. we just can't keep relying and saying okay you know, by age, we're taking the five oldest dudes out to the factory. We got to bring somebody new so they become familiar with the system and watch what an experienced team, even if it's just two people that have prior experience. It pains me greatly when I go out to one or two of the manufacturers that have large customer acceptance areas and it will go out and after the first 15 or 20 minutes and everybody gets the wow factor, I'm grabbing a creeper a flashlight, some tape, and my cell phone to take pictures of things that I find as I crawl underneath the rig. And about 45 minutes or an hour later, I shoot out the back tailboard and I look at the rig next to me and these people have tape all over the rig. You know, I, I got to get the plug in for people that foolishly paint their aerials black or some other non-discernible color. And they've got tape all over the black painted roof of the cab and over the black aerial device and we'll be the, we'll be in these adjacent bays for eight or ten hours and watch nobody in that group ever went underneath the rig or moved the aerial up out of the cradle, got it off to the side so they could tilt the cab to look underneath. And folks, that's what's making the thing go down the road. The paint and the graphics are pretty, but pretty ain't making it go, and pretty ain't going to put the fire out. And, and um, you know, and that's and that's the whole point of of the work that you and Mike, you know, and other folks do it too. I'm sure that the work that you folks do that, I mean, it was just so obvious to me in my fire department. And I, and I have friends in other volunteering career departments who do the same thing. You know, New York city has a whole, they have a whole department. They have a, they have a whole bureau that of people that plan out the rigs and spec them and, and check them out. And most volunteer and small career departments do not have that. They, they, they have to put together an ad hoc committee and, and select whoever it is. Some places do it regularly, and they have some people with experience. As you said, you bring some new people in. But the bottom line is, I don't care who your committee is, unless it's a big city, like you said, with a fleet like New York or L.A., everybody should get professional help. Now, this is not a car. You can go and pick up, and even if you're careful going to buy a car or an F-250, you can still get taken by a salesman, you know, you, because it looks so good. But it's just a vehicle, and I hate to say it's just a vehicle, but – we're, we're talking seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars for a pump or a couple of million for a towel ladder. I can't believe that there's people that would even venture down that road without getting some type of professional assistance and guidance. You know, and, and, and you can measure that. It's not like there's a there's a one size fits all thing. You got to have you got to hire the guy. He comes to 20 meetings. It's thirteen thousand dollars. And at the end of it, I know there's variables and how you, how much help you can get. But. And then when you get to the final inspection, and, and I had the, some personal experience with that uh, recently, and it's hard for me to believe that people, even even the local department that I'm talking about, that's spent seven, let's call it seven hundred thousand dollars. So seven hundred thousand dollars for a rig, and let's just call it two thousand dollars just to hire a guy just to come and do the final inspection for you. And and, and I was talking to these people. I said, you won't spend two dollars on a seven hundred dollar purchase. You would have spent two more dollars, two single dollar bills for a seven hundred dollar purchase, just to make sure you're getting what, what you ordered, just to make sure that what looks like what you wanted is what you wanted. Or well, never mind the stuff that's buried that's inside a component or inside inside a piece of machinery, you know, and, and all the I don't even know all the things that can go wrong. You know what I'm saying? And uh, although I've been in the fire service for a long time, I don't have a lot of experience there. So the point is, you know, for our listeners, is that you, you really got to educate yourself. You really got to prepare. And the whole process is quite important from, from, from writing the specs to the, to the, to the pre-construction meetings and, and all through that. The, 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 it's a gigantic process involving money. You, you're going to have to spend money to make sure that the money at the end that you're spending is, is well spent and is protected, you know? Well, to, to, like you said, money. to back it up, John, I mean, you're, like you, that was perfect way of saying it. You wouldn't spend two more dollars on a $7 purchase. On a $700 purchase, you that's know, right. And that's and that, what and 2000 is to 700000 you know? So, so we're talking, we're talking, you know, we, we know we, we come up with the idea that we need to replace a rig or it's time to replace a rig or it's on schedule to be replaced or whatever in your particular department. I, I, you know what? I just want to interrupt you, and I and I apologize. 
because there's one thing that Tom said a few minutes ago that I, that I want to bring up. And it's something that someone else told me, a, 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 an, an apparatus inspector told me this. I remember, And I remember hearing it about, well, so, gee, so you can come up with the group then and, you know, we'll let them know that we're bringing up, you know, our inspector and we want to have it in that, you know, customer acceptance area so somebody can look at it. And a guy told me, well, you don't have to do that. So, some manufacturers uh, are not real happy about that. They said so, some places just bring up an inspector as part of the committee. He's just another guy that's on a committee and crawling around underneath and measuring stuff. They don't know he's somebody that maybe the fire department hired to do an inspection for them. So so it's not like every manufacturer, and you know manufacturers way better than I do, Tom. It's not like every manufacturer has clergy people walking around and have the, the highest morals in the world. You know, some of them would rather you not bring a professional inspector, you know, because they want to get that thing out the door. And and they're well-meaning and they're, they're pretty honest people, but... So you're, it, that, that's another example of why you really do need to have some professional people come with you, you know? Yeah. So Chief Salka, so to go to that point, all right? During the pandemic, when it, when it was impossible to travel, to be able to go do final inspections, I, I probably did 50 plus. The number, I guess the number is really immaterial. 50 plus virtual final inspections on Navy fire apparatus where we would provide, and this was, I think, four or five different manufacturers. So it's 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 non-denominational, this the following comments, right? We would send the manufacturer a specific listing of the individual photos that we wanted of certain areas of the rig, all right, together with the rest of the technical documentation. And it would take me longer to go through and review that material, take individual pictures. You think, consider taking the rig and putting it up on a lift, for example. And now I'm describing there's there's probably 24 different areas underside that I wanted individual pictures of that I could look at. If I found something, then having to make comments, you know, using you know Microsoft Paint, you know, circle, put a little arrow. Here's the issue. Here's what needs to get to get get fixed. And have to do that on rigs. So for a long period of time, and again, this is no one's fault, but this is this is what we're still coming out of. So for the better part of a couple of years, manufacturers, even those that welcome, you know, and have very, very nice customer acceptance areas, got used to doing final inspections by people doing a walk around with a video. All right. At the same time, understandably, no different than us in the fire service, we can't hire enough guys and gals, brothers and sisters that want to do want to do this work, that want to be a firefighter. The manufacturing industry is suffering. Every fire truck manufacturer I've been to post pandemic has got had signs recruiting. Uh, they have things up on Facebook all the time. Open advertisements. They're 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 hire, hiring folks. So much like. Us in the fire service, when we lose the senior man, where he's taken 20 plus years of experience down the road, we we bring in the rookie that's gone through as good a training academy as we have. He doesn't have that same time of experience. That's exactly what's happening in the manufacturing industry. So now you go well post pandemic, you go out to do a final inspection. I am no longer surprised by what I find. All right. Uh, including, as again, my definition of showstopper, something that got missed that now is impossible to do, all right, or without great amount of rework. But the number of number of things identified on, call it the punch list, all right, different manufacturers have different processes as to how you record and document that. Many of the better ones, I will say this, you write up what the issue is, and there's a photo to back up because the fellow – that's or a guy or gal that's going to do the rework on on the unit. It's pretty hard for them to just go off a description. So the better manufacturers have a system where you capture based on where it is on the rig, a photo, and then a written description of what the issue is. And when you do the final walk around upon conclusion of your day or day and a half final inspection, you get together with the team of folks from the manufacturer and you go over that list item by item. 
All right. Well, and Tom, let, let, and hang on for that one second, because uh, okay. we we really want, want you to walk us through, um, well, we got the time to, to, you know, the final inspection. So let's back up for a second. We talked about, we talked about, you know, the concept, the idea that we need to replace a rig, whatever that is. It's on the calendar. It's time to, the rig got smashed up, whatever, all the different reasons we would buy a new pumper or ladder or whatever. And then we've got our committee. We talked about don't committee ourselves to death. Don't add to too many people. Keep it reasonable so we don't get bogged down and put the right people on a committee. Put somebody kind of newer, put someone kind of older, someone with some expertise, you know, well-balanced, someone that knows what they're doing with it so we're not wasting our time. Then we've got the pre-construction meetings. Then we've got you know, a little bit of mid You know, all these different things with this committee being consistent going through. So let, let's talk about this. Let's let's get to, let's because I think you're getting there right now. Let's talk for our for our for our listeners. Let's talk, and this is what John was like so excited the other day. Let's talk the final inspection. So we we go to whatever manufacturer. We walk in the door. Walk us through the do's and don'ts of a final inspection for that for that piece of apparatus. Because like I said, it would take us like nine hours to do the whole. Let's committee spec and all that stuff, which we talked right, about. Right. We, 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 I think we made some great points earlier about that. Some people are going to be noting, but let's talk because this is huge. Like you said, this is it. This is all right. We're going we're gonna to take this thing home, you know. So, what are the, what are you looking for? What are the do's and don'ts of the final inspection? What recommendations would you give a committee out there or another group? Okay, you get ready to go up there, Tom. What do you think? Well, get a pad of paper out. Let me tell you the do's and don'ts. What would it be? Okay, things to do before you even go out there and once the date gets scheduled, all right? Number one, to go to your comment, Chief Lasky, make sure you're you're, you're getting the same group of folks, all right, that you had through the process. Because the way the industry is right now, many times with some manufacturers, they give you a date and make it look like it's a doc. You, you've just got a surgeon's appointment that you've waited six months for. All right. In some cases, now you've waited 30 months for, and you need to be there next Tuesday. All right. To start the inspection. If, uh, if this is counter to what the manufacturers are going to like to hear, but the truth is, if you can't get your group of people together, that's the date they're telling you it's going to come off the final end of the line. And it will be washed, waxed. The tires will be arm rolled. It'll look pretty, all right? But it just means, you know, 24 hours later, it was still on the manufacturing floor or, or they were testing something. So if you can't get all of your people together, all right, that, that date is when they would like you to have, have you there, all right? Within reason, you need to be there plus or minus, but make sure that your committee can stay intact. Second thing is to tell your salesperson what your expectations are as to what you want to do and accomplish. All right. If it's an engine, you, well, let's assume you can travel out the night before. All right. You got to make sure your groups wants to work eight, 10 hours to do this. This is not, it's a two hour show. And then we're going to be like, uh, Hey, when's the coffee in Danish coming here? All right. <laughs> uh, it's it's tough to do one engine in a in a full day, maybe a day day and a quarter, right? So you're going to tell your salesperson, this is what we want to do. All right. We're going to go out and we'll kick the tires and look at it for the first first half hour. All right. At the very least, we want to make sure that there are creepers available that we can go underneath the rig. It would be preferred if the manufacturer can get it up on lifts. You can do a much, much better and thorough inspection if you can get the rig up on hydraulic lifts and spend as much time as you need. A lot of the fleet customers that I've worked with, that's that's a requirement. You know, if we got to move the rig from A to B or start the inspection someplace and we're not in the customer inspection area, we're in a work area, but that's where the lifts are. Much, much preferred to get the rig. And, and up, a very valuable, lifts. sorry to interrupt you, a very valuable point you make. Because nobody goes to their automobile dealership and gets under, he puts it up on the lift to look underneath the new car. So now they go to buy a fire engine and they don't, they don't even think about that. They don't even think about putting it up right. in here and looking at it because they've never bought a fire engine before. Right. Most salespeople or on the manufacturing side are going to think that it's somewhere between four to maybe six hours. You're looking at the rig. You're going over the specs to kind of make sure everything is there maybe go out for a road test. That That's like the minimum, all right? Anything less than that, you're fooling yourself. 
these things that I'm stating, all right, in addition, if it's at anything that has a pump on it, all right, you're going to want to tell them we want to go to the pump house and we want to do a 40-minute service test to duplicate what UL or whatever your outside testing company did. Do not repeat. Do not fall for the party line of saying, oh, it was just tested by fill in the blank last week and everything is great. If it's a 1500 GPM pump, I'm hoping it can pump 1500 GPM. But if I've got a front trash line or three, two and a half inch discharges off the back, those lines were never flowed. They were just hydrostatically tested. No, no one has ever flowed water through those. So if you're like a lot of Maryland departments, you're, you're like no cross lay nation and everything comes off the back. I want to flow. I'm going to do flow test off of those two, three or four rear two and a half inch discharges and make sure they flow and see what what pressure loss you have and just run it up to 150 PSI. But because the manufacturer is wants to build fire trucks, if you need time in the pump house, you're taking time from their production time. So you need to set that up in a, a head. If your rig has got a foam system on it, again, you can't be flowing, you know, class B. Do people really go pick up a new engine and not pump it though? I see it all the happen? time. Really? I, they I, I can tell, I can, I can I tell from last week. <laughs> I, I, I can tell from the feedback or the facial response that I get back from the salesperson. If at pre-construction we'll fast forward and say, Hey, 14 months from now, when we come out or 15 or 16 months, I hope I'm still alive for the final. All right. Here's what we want to do. And if you then start getting the standard party lines like, Oh, well, it'll, it'll be UL tested. Uh, at one time we're, we're out doing a Navy inspection, me and the EVT mechanic, uh, and we're at an unnamed manufacturer. And while we're up operating the tower, all right, the, one of the workers happens to mention, because we're finding stuff that's, you know, mechanically interlocks don't work, this, that, whatever. So the mechanic said that uh, Dave says to the, the handler, he said, uh, so this thing passed you well? And the guy goes, oh, hell no. They're coming next week to do the, to do the testing. All right. So li little addition to the specifications, all outside third-party testing, fire pump, aerial, air system, what foam system, all got to be done before we get there. You know, I don't I, I love playing with the stuff, but it's not my job to be your quality control guy to tell you what's not working on your fire truck while we've got, you know, five other committee members here, maybe two of them very young and impressionable, that when they the first time they see one thing doesn't doesn't work, as small as it might be, Chiefs, you, and I'm sure you've experienced this, you know, taken up from a a, a good job on a fire ground and, and you know, somebody, you know. Uh, something happened with a valve on the rig, you know, and a line got a line either didn't get charged, you know, or it, or it got charged ahead of time. And they'll come back and tell, you know, ask the the the, the engine show for what happened, and they'll say, ah, oh, there's, you know, the, the, this thing malfunctioned. I I hate this rig. Well, you you probably if you did a morning checkout, you may maybe would have found that ahead of time. You know, fire crown like a final inspection is not the time to find out all the stuff that doesn't work. But that's typically what happens right now. So you set the stage with your salesperson ahead of time. Uh, you, road test, all right? This varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Just because you're a driver in your fire department doesn't mean at certain manufacturers you're going to be allowed to drive that rig on the streets in that community. Some manufacturers require that you have a CDL. So if your fire department requires you to have a CDL, you're golden. But when you go to this one manufacturer, you're just not raising your hand and saying, oh, yeah, I got a CDL. They want to see it. They make a photocopy of it you know, to cover themselves for liability. Elsewise, you're just going to drive around on the test track. So those are all the little nuances you want to get squared away ahead of time. So again, this, this happens incrementally with the larger committees. You got eight guys and eight people want to drive the fire truck. At that point, I'd say, I'm staying back. You know, I'm going to catch up with some paperwork and stuff. It's not my fire truck. You've got to go out with the salesperson. You know, they're not going to let your eight people, if you've got seating for eight, they're not going to let you drive all around town by yourself. There's got to be a representative of somebody from the 
from the uh, the company on there. And in some cases, you have to have a CDL. You guys come back and tell me what the issues are. We'll take a picture. We'll write it up on a report and keep trucking. I'm more interested is when we're going to flow test the rig. If it if it uh, if it's got a waterway on the aerial device, if it's not a not a pump, I think where it's possible uh, with with the kind of weather conditions and and where your truck's being built, you want to make arrangements. You want to flow water through the, through the aerial device and make sure that works, particularly if it's got a remote control nozzle, because many times those remote control nozzles at the end of an aerial or particularly on a tower ladder, those things maybe haven't been programmed properly. They came from your favorite brass manufacturer, got it bolted up with the ASA flange torque. And again, other than if it's if it's had the third party testing, they've made sure it flowed a thousand gallons a minute. That's great. You just bought a one point uh, two point one dollar million dollar tower ladder with two two monitors in a platform, one an eighteen thousand dollar remote control monitor and one somebody that had some smarts a manual monitor with smooth bore tips and a tiller bar. All right. I got you, Chief. Glad. Sorry it took so long. All right. All right. If you want to put a fog nozzle on a tower ladder, that's great. If you run a nursery, it's great for water in nurseries. Doesn't do a whole hell of a lot. You know. How many um, times we talked about that, John? Guys that put fog nozzles on master streams. But anyway. Right? And, and 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 you go out and you go test it. And we had one of these just the other week. All right. Where the guy's saying, well, that's the way we ordered it. We bring down the head guy from the aerial division, he goes, well, that's the way we ordered it. I'm like, but it's not correct. It doesn't work right. Okay, we need to figure out the, the programming of the monitor to get the right kind of sweep. I said, they didn't spend $18,000 to watch the thing go left and right 45 degrees and go above the horizontal. We need to go below the horizontal, right? Right. And so well, – this, so this, so, so, keep going. so like I said, so we're we're do, we're we're talking still pretty much the final we're talking final inspection. But what you should be thinking about before you even get there, this is know, what the, you want to tell your salesperson so he can get all the behind the scenes logistics lined up, so that when you go there, they're prepared for 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 your inspection. So let's assume for the moment, Chief Lasky, that they say, "Gee, sorry, you know, we we only have one pair of lifts and they're dedicated to production." We we can't get the rig on lifts. Okay, not a problem. We're going to go underneath the rig with with the with with a creeper. At some point, we're going to want to tilt the cab inside the inside the facility. All right, and look at that. We're going to climb up inside the pump box as as much as we can. If it's a brand new rig in your fleet and not similar or identical to anything else you have prior to you. Coming there, the manufacturer have should have certified weights, all right, for the front axle and the rear axle or what it weighed both with and without water. If they haven't done that, you again, that's a pre-construction item. You say, I want that before I get there. If you're bringing out six guys or gals and you got a six six person committee, at some point you're going to fill up the rig with with water, all right. You can fill up the foam tank with water. All right. And you're going to run that rig over the scales, front axle, then back, then the whole rig, then the back axle with the six people in the cab. And you're going to verify those weights. Right. Depending on what you told the manufacturer, you're going to put on for hose and equipment. Those weights are known. You can calculate that and you can make sure before you get it home that the rig's not going to be overweight. Well, how often do you see that? I mean, we see that all the time with people that Let's keep putting this on there. Let's keep putting this on there. And before you know it, they've overloaded this rig, which creates all kinds of mechanical problems later on, whether structurally and, you know, everything right. else. A lot of men, a, a lot of the majority of fire departments, again, with the exception of the of the large fleets, right, still are unaware of this part of the NFPA 1901, now 1900 standard that that don't understand that. It's it's you, the user, the fire department. You have to tell your manufacturer, your preferred vendor, it needs to be in your specs, all right, as to what I call it the specified hose load. Showing a picture, and here's a description of the hose, and here's an inventory of and the weights of all the equipment we're going to put on here. If you fail to do that, the manufacturer is going to go back and say it's a standard pumper. I only needed to allow for 2,000 pounds. 
if it's over a certain cubic foot or any kind of aerial device, I only need it to allow for 2,500 pounds. If you put more than 2,500 pounds on it and you didn't tell me, you, the user, are at fault, not me, the manufacturer. And to this day, 14 years later, I am amazed, Michael and I both, at the number of people that think, well, the salesperson did go to Chief Salka's coming. Salesperson person we did 10 meetings in our in our station he walked around the rig he knew what we were carrying yep that's not on him you need to tell the person what you what 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 you're going to carry if you put it in the world of going to buy a pickup truck and decide you're going to buy an f-250 rather than f-550 and overload the f-250 thinking i can put everything in a kitchen sink it's got the same bed but it doesn't have the same gvw and something happens who is it on? It's on. It's on me. I that's overloaded great, the vehicle. That's a great. That's a great example. That's a great example. And another example of the kind of information that the average fire department chief, truck committee, is just not going to know. They're just not going to know. And that's just one point that they're not going to know unless they have a professional advice. Yeah. So when when you go the day of your inspection, like I said somebody, one or two people are better. All right. If, if you've got the mechanic, he's the person you want want, want, want to get. And a, a lot of departments outside of the fleets are reticent to bring the mechanic, particularly if it's an outside contractor. That person can be your best eyes and ears. Because on day 366, when the one-year bumper-to-bumper warranty goes out, unless you're married to going back to the your manufacturer for the service provider for other warranty work, he or she – is, is going to be the person that's going to be trying to fix your rig, it would make a heck of a lot of sense to me to have your mechanic, right? He's going to go underneath your rig. If you've got a larger committee, I found to keep everybody on point ahead of time, before you go out, you have the committee chairman break up the guys or gals in the groups of two. Two people are going to take the cab, everything inside the cab, the graphics, paint, and everything on the cab. One or two people are going to take the pump, the pump panel, and all the other special systems and focus in on that. And two other people are going to focus on the body. So that way you don't have six people all looking at the same thing. Five people agreeing, saying, yeah, that's right. Somebody else saying, no, that, that's, that's not right. Just about every manufacturer on a custom rig, you're going to have to sign off a dashboard and rocker switch layout, a pump panel layout. So the people that did that, that got into the, the the weeds on the details of that, those are the people you want to have go looking at that rig. On a recent final inspection, had somebody within the first five minutes that the inspection went south, the person that laid out everything on the dashboard and the rocker switch arrangement to match something on another manufacturer's rig, but a similar arrangement left to right, Rolls open a blueprint, looks in the overhead and goes, this ain't right. So we get the salesperson and this person was highly agitated. All right. They didn't have this calm Irish demeanor that I have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they bring somebody down from upstairs. All right. And that person says, uh, let me follow up. He comes back five minutes later and says, oh, yeah, we messed up. Uh, the people in engineering that laid out your dashboard didn't look at what you signed off and approved. So it's different. Uh, that chief Lasky, that can be a showstopper. All right. Because now you're like, all right, what do we got to do? You know, how much are we, the customer willing to bend because you, the manufacturer didn't follow the information signatures and sign off approvals are really, really important. And a lot of folks have kind of gotten away from that because they're just saying, well, just send me an email and it's that it's okay. Now I want to see a name and a date on this documentation so that if something the wheels do do come off the bus we can backpedal and try to diagnose wh where things w went 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 bad well and again this comes back to you know the i don't i don't know if intimidation is the right word or not but you know you can see a lot of guys and gals that w i've seen it where they walk in there look i we joke about this I, I love to play the dumb fireman on tv like i don't know what i'm talking about and i just listen and smile and watch other people do their stuff and i go okay here we go and you see somebody walking around and it, it's almost like they're afraid like they think they can't say anything you know they're they're, they're it's again it's just you walk in and like you said it's all washed wax it, you know 
the fancy room, the showroom, if you will. And, and the last thing they're thinking is putting tape on things saying this ain't right. This ain't right. Taking pictures, get a creeper. And I'll tell you, I'll, I, and I think you'll agree the great man, the greatest manufacturers I've ever dealt with actually, they want you, they, you know, you know I, they want you to get out of creepers. They want you to, they want all this done because that's how you get return business. The worst thing is to get a rig home and find out things that working that you missed and people in a bad mouth and that manufacturer, the good ones I've worked with Tom have said, bring them, you know what, whatever you need to do, you bring them. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, you see that this is what you do. You and Mike, I mean, the great manufacturers are like, no, 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 no. You bring everybody you got that, that you want to do. And, and we'll walk through it within reason. I mean, you know, right. right. You, yeah. I, I would rather have, if you break committees up, up like that, and your consultant, your your outside advisor is out doing his thing, lo- lo- looking, you know, at for, for certain for certain things as well. I b- would r- much rather have people say, "You put a put a piece of tape on something," and if when I'm if I was on the underside of the rig and, and pop out and 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 get up off the creeper, and somebody come over and say, "Tom, I got a couple of things I'm questioning. You tell me what you think," and and we'll look at them and yup, that's that's not correct or yeah. Uh, and it's been sometimes like when it gets to some, uh, some you know, paint finish. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a little over the top. Let's go look at some of the other. Or, or somebody marks something and you look at it and go, no, 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 that, that you know, because you'd rather mark something that you could pull off and say, no, you, you know what? Good idea. But no, this is actually right. We're, we're there. They, they did good here because some guys don't know. Right. It, it, exactly. From exactly. paper to real. Right. Let's then then. Th- Make sure also that there's one person, and many times the salespeople will take the lead on this, chief of of recording everything. Okay, but somebody on the committee above and beyond, no, no matter what the manufacturer's system is. Again, I'm old school. I'm I'm there with with yellow line paper and a and a and a black pen, and I'm making comments on that together with comments on the paperwork that was supplied by the manufacturer. Some people call it the component list. Other people call it the stripper. It's typically the 12 to maybe 18 page document that just has one liners on what's there. And then if you find something that's incorrect, you can then refer to the long verbiage spec that in many cases today, it's always in excess of 100 pages. You know, it's pretty common, even on a standard pumper, it's 140 pages long. And I get it. Unless you're a fleet person or a fleet customer, the average volunteer firefighter is not adept to reading 140 pages of stuff and a comprehending what that means or b somebody saying uh here's a good example hey tom i i thought we had at pre-construction on the on the the, the rear discharges that we had one in the hose bed and two out the rear because the manufacturer said there wasn't enough room to get the third sleeve through the water tank and say, okay, let's go back. This is again, why the continuity on the committee is important. Let's go back and look at the change order. Let's go back and look at the Martha blueprint from pre-construction. Oh, you see, yeah, that was discussed, but then the decision was made. No, we wanted all three out the back. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. So a lot of times you need to go back to things that were previously discussed, chief, to make sure that what you're looking at is correct. Uh, uh, just want to backpedal one thing. One of the things you want to key off the your salesperson to ahead of time, however many people you're bringing, if you're bringing six, say, I want to have six copies of the blueprint gotcha. and six, six copies of the whatever, all right? So people, if they haven't put their hands on that material up to that point, as they're visually going around the rig, right? The guys or gals that signed off that did the dashboard layout and the pump panel layout, uh, those folks always bring that stuff. But there have been more times than not that in one of those two areas, something was done like last minute as like a a running manufacturing change that didn't get documented. And small little things we can kind of let go. You know, if the drain valves didn't end up exactly where I want, that's okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not that much of a nerd that I'm, I'm measuring up and over to make sure. But for example, if we talked about at length, if the rig, for example, had cross lays, 
and the cross lathes were to be no more than 66 inches from the ground to the bottom of the bed unloaded, then it better be 66 inches. All right. right. If you go to tape it and, you know, the manufacturer can kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, hey, sorry, we, we, we missed. Well, if you missed by half an inch, I might give that to you. If we missed by two and a half inches, we got a problem. The manufacturer can get stuck when somebody starts going around with the tape measure around all the steps around the rig 360 degrees. And if that first step exceeds 24 inches, because that's an NFPA requirement, you know, there's even been some healthy discussions on that, that the cust that the manufacturer will say, oh, the rig's got to be loaded, you know. OK, well, we're going to we want to go do that. Uh, there's been a few instances where the manufacturer, if we were really that concerned about the weight of the vehicle, and again, you need to do this ahead of time. You can't do that the day of. Say, we want to have the rig sandbagged, right, to to simulate the weight in the hose bed and in, in the body compartments. And then we're going to weigh the vehicle. Then there'll be absolutely no surprises when we get home and we weigh the re vehicle, which is something Mike and I uh, push the folks before you finally make the final payment on the vehicle, you load it up with your hose tools and equipment and you run it over certified scales. And if you haven't been satisfied previously that you could check that box, that's, that's the time you have to do it. Otherwise you'll probably end up at some point contacting us and say, I mean, we, we found rigs chief that have been, you know, still with un under warranty that have been overweight we found rigs that are five to seven years old. The customer never knew they were overweight until we one of the requ our requirements. I, I, I know some guys that never take them over a scale. Right. We want them scaled. And in a couple of cases, you know, uh, I know Mike has had a couple, you know, a fleet of seven rigs and three of them were out of service by, you know, 1600 hours on day one because they were overloaded and, 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 and could not easily be fixed, you know. Well, and so, this is, you know, you get, you you know, you get the rig back home and you start finding out that, and this has happened, John and I were talking about this, an SCBA's bracket is missing in the officer seat. You would think, how did you miss that? I mean, this is real, you know, real life stories, guys get back and this not working or this light not working. You don't, I mean, there's just, I mean, whatever. And, and now you're, now you're waiting for their service tech or whatever it is in your region, your part of the country to come over and take care of the rig because you're not going to drive it all the way back four states to where you got it from or three states. Yeah, you know. it, it, exactly. And again, it's unfortunate. It's just it's it's like when the president gives the State of the Union, Mike and I have written a couple articles like this. You know, here, here's the state of the apparatus industry. It's just very much different than it has been in my history. It's very much different even than it was two, two years ago an increasingly amount of pressure for every manufacturer, whether it's a small family owned company or a large company owned, owned by a holding company who's only, you know, uh, when, when I first got in the apparatus industry, I thought to myself that this has got to be the next best thing to being Pope in the Catholic church. I mean, who, who, uh, you know, a, a greater vocation someone wouldn't want to have than to be building a fire truck for, 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 for firefighters. But, and in some manufacturing uh, facilities, 80 or 90 percent of the folks, they're volunteer firefighters. So if you talk to them, they get it right away. If you can tell from uh, initial reaction when you're talking with somebody internally in the office, particularly the engineering folks, you know, the engineering nerds, as I call them. All right. They're, they're great guys and gals. And you can tell right away where they get it when you start talking about particularly a dimensional thing and why it's important to you and their ability to pick up on that and go, oh, yeah, I get that versus somebody that just says, well, that's, you know, that well, that, that that's what we designed, you know, and you kind of get the shoulder shrug. Well, the shoulder shrug's not helping me, you know, <laughs> I'm here in, inspecting my, you know. Today's cost my one point one million dollar custom pumper. Well, so ev everybody's under pressure to get the rig out the door, and like your your comment on you know some lights don't work. Okay, that kind of stuff should all be able to be fixed and corrected at the point where the where the rig was built. I get it that when you deliver it, and if you're delivering a rig from Wisconsin to New York, stuff's going to happen. I, I I I get it. Things that worked when you were there might not work when you get it home to New York or out to you in Texas. All right. Well, that's why we have service and warranty and the most important relationship 
that a fire department can have beyond the bonding and the friendship they have with the salesperson. It's great that your salesperson can be your friend. All right. <laughs> but when the thing doesn't work, chances are, unless it's a very small manufacturer, your salesperson's not going to show up with the snap on toolbox to fix your rig. I, I tell you, most of, go ahead. I, I, was gonna say, I used to say, if you want to be a millionaire, build a CAD system that works not just for the cops, it works for the fire department too. And, Build fire apparatus that you could back up with good maintenance. You know, with a good right. maintenance and repair and warranty division, you'll 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 be a billionaire if you could do that. But and right. there's some great ones out there. Don't get me wrong. Exactly. I mean, your, your your service provider or your warranty service provider is your best friend because with your case in Louisville that you have the rig ten years. I I, I admire you. There's only a, very few fleets out here out east. You know that it can turn their rigs over in seven or eight years, a couple years reserve, and then it's 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 down the road. For departments, that if you're going to keep the keep the rig for the length of the period that you've paid money for the warranty, then if you do your due diligence at the final inspection, well above and beyond all the operational tests and the testing of the of the pump and the and the and the road test, and you do a good thorough final inspection. You have the final inspection report. You go over all each of those issues with the working team that's going to fix your rig so they understand where you're coming from. And when the rig shows up at your at the dealership, you go back out to the dealership, even if it's a couple hours away before they deliver it to your department. And you go over that rig with the punch list to make sure that everything has been corrected to your satisfaction. So at least you can be cons- be, feel good that the day the rig shows up on your ramp, they put, you know back it up in, in the in in the station and set the maxi break. That to the best of your ability, everything that you and your your committee your team identified has been corrected. Without a doubt, you're going to find other things that go wrong. And folks that weren't involved in the process, the rank and file firefighter, all right, or the driver on B shift that had a crummy attitude, but, and you, and you, and you didn't want to bring him. you, you know, he's going to find something on his shift. He'll write something up, you know, at, at seven, you know, seven ten in the morning on the walk around because he didn't like the rig because he wasn't involved. Well, you deal with that stuff as it comes along, you know, it just, it's part oh. of the territory. Well, so let me, let me do this because we're winding down here and then I'll say this again for, for our, for our listeners. Um, I, I, I we haven't even scratched the surface of everything that goes into the idea that we need a rig, how we go about the rig, the bids for the rig, awarding bids, you know, meetings with salespeople, uh, pre-construction, you know, pre-paint, all the different, all the different things that go along, um, just to get to the final inspection, which is like I said, when John and I were talking about this the other day, you know, you popped up right away. He was like, we gotta get, we gotta get Tom on the show, you know, that whole thing. Um so let's let's finish here by the what advice would you give to that fire department regarding the you, you you've you've covered a lot and you may you may be recapping some things obviously final inspection you're you're looking at me you're saying okay Rick this is what I've got for you I'm like dude tell me this first time I ever rode a fire engine in my life I've, I've never I ne- I, look I've been here for a while but I'm I this is the first time me I've actually ordered a fire engine. We've been through this process, dude. We're getting ready to do the final inspection. What advice would you give that that committee or that chief that's get about the final inspection? You know, what advice would you give them? Okay, make sure you're bringing all the same people that have worked with you from the start. Make sure somebody's bringing a hard copy or a laptop that has every piece of correspondence that's going on from the from the project from inception. Well, that's, a good, that's a good point. Every In, every correspondence, yes, right. Inception up 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 to this. Up to, up to this point, don't rely upon the salesperson or the manufacturer to 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 do you know to do your office work. You if you show up and darn few people do, where, where they they print out and if somebody shows up with a three inch thick three ring binder, right, and they've got it tabbed. Here's everything that went down. So as soon as something comes up, what can derail a final real quickly is the first time you come up with a, any kind of stumbling block and everybody's looking at one another like, uh, 
I, I, I don't I don't know how this happened. <laughs> Somebody that can right away pull it up on a laptop and go, OK, here's the email it went, went here and, and and be able to put that 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 item the rest so an hour and 15 minutes into your eight hour inspection everybody doesn't get upset you know and it gets get gets a little 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 ornery so you're gonna you're gonna 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 do that you're gonna make sure that you tell the salesperson ahead of time here's your expectations you're gonna find out what the requirements are for driving the rig on or off property make arrangements whether it's at a pump house or a static a drafting location that you want to you want to do a service test on the rig you want to flow test some 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 discharges if it has a foam system or any other kind of special system on there find out what their requirements are what the manufacturer's standard protocol is for uh for testing those systems you're going to tell the salesperson uh i, I want to see in, in a pdf format or you can print it out hard copy and hand it to us the day we're there. Hard copies of all the testing documentation of what you folks internally did and as what is what as well as what the third party outside testing company did. So we can verify that. I want to see certified weights both with and without water on the vehicle. And if you don't have certified weights on property, we're going to want to load the vehicle up and during our driving test, run it over those certified weights. So we can verify the information you've given us jives with what. what how, how easy is it the, for them to accommodate you when you referred to like the sandbagging to add some weight? Do is that a, is that a weird request or are people go? Yeah, we know we got them already. It, it's that, that's 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 a little bit out of the norm, Chief. Sometimes fleets require that if they're buying a rig that they don't want electronic stability control, but they want to verify the the tilt table test that it will, would require the manufacturer to sandbag the rig and then to tilt table test the unit so that's really contingent upon whether you spec electronic stability control on the vehicle and relying on that to keep you out of the near occasions of sin as compared to having the manufacturer say oh yeah we built a vehicle similar to this and don't worry tom you look like an honest guy I don't think you're going to drive aggressively. Don't worry, it ain't going to tip <laughs> over. <laughs> so gotcha. if you do if you do those kinds of things and set up the expectation with the salesperson and say, here's what we want to accomplish during our, and you set the, the standard for that based before maybe even they book the flights. Don't don't get involved with one of these things like saying, okay, we're going to fly you in on day one and we're going to get we're going to we're going to be on site at 11 o'clock in the morning and then we're flying out the next afternoon at 4 p.m and that you know that may or may not work for you based if you don't have experience rely upon the experience of the salesperson to say how long do you normally allow for this and, and get him to understand you're not there it's not a kick the tires we're there to look at paint and graphics and drive around let everybody get 10 minutes behind the wheel and and listen to what a newer style Jake break sounds like, you know, without straight pipes. We're we're here to do a thorough inspection. So there's so so not there's no surprise for the salesperson's perspective and to make sure that the, the manufacturing folks can make as much of their production facilities as may be needed accessible to you to allow you to have a a a, a very good, safe you know, and productive final inspection. The fleet folks have this down, and they and they know it's it's a day and a half or two days per rig. You know, we're 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 not knocking out two pumpers in 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 a day and a quarter. And you're more worried about. Uh, I've had a couple of unfortunate circumstances like this. We're 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 kind of knee deep in the inspection at four thirty, and the salesperson saying, "Hey, dinner's at six o'clock." You know, and had a couple of the fire department reps say, "Yep." Yeah, Dinner can be at eight thirty. We can be we can do a Mickey D's drive through. You know, we're we're not stopping the inspection for you know for you to take us out to dinner. It's setting that expectation so there's no surprises along the way, and the salespeople and the manufacturing facility knows how thorough your group is going to be in wanting to look at your rig from the bumper to the back step. Well, like I said, this the you know it, it, the whole process is vital to ending up with a a piece of apparatus that represents your department 
And, and, and just as importantly, your, your investment from the community, the people or the government, whatever, whoever is funding that rig, that you're doing your due diligence to put the best vehicle on the street to protect the people we said we're to protect. Um, the whole process is criti- critical, but man, oh man, this whole th- 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 this this whole final inspection part of it is this is your last chance to make any major corrections. There's always little things you have to make. You may, like you said, you may have to go, all right, it's a half inch or an inch. Yeah, we, all right, I got that. But this is your last chance before you get it home and go, you know, like, like you said, there's a lot of fault finders out there, a lot of fault finders. And when you get back, they're going to be the first ones that are going to nitpick or whatever and all that. Some of that you just have to put up with, you know, that you didn't get whatever for this person, you know, right. The, the right cup holder. I'm joking, but you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> on the other hand, when you go to a job and things don't work right, now somebody has to answer for that. And again, this comes down to those that, you know, there are some egotistical maniacs out there, some control freaks that don't want people from their department to contribute to be part of it because that's how they do everything. That's it's not just a piece of apparatus. That's how they run their fire department where they, they just don't want input from people because they're intimidated by the people that work around them, you know, that kind of stuff versus those that say like me, I, I always use John Ashman, God rest his soul. He just passed away. I, 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 I there's times I go, where's John? Oh, he's, Oh, he's, oh, he's up. He's where? Oh, he's check. I forgot. He's even going this week. I, I had complete complete trust in that individual to know that he and, and our chief engineer, Edgar Kobe, our EVT was going to make sure, you know, good God, they, they absolute confidence in them. And I'm the fight, you know, I'm not going to order stuff, especially I'm not going to order stuff I'm not riding on anymore. You know, I'm like, I, I better make sure I have people in the process that actually ride the fire engine having a say. So, you know, you know what I'm saying? Have to be the workers, the right. working class, make sure they have their input you know, there used to be a time, I'm sure this doesn't go on anymore, where certain manufacturers, the big thing was to take you to 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 go golfing, to strip clubs, to all kinds of things, all the horror stories you hear out there. And you never did nothing. That was their job was to get you all boozed up and party and go golfing. Yeah. I remember that. I remember certain ones. It's like, well, we're going. We're, I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm not golfing. We, we're going there to look at the rig. You yeah, know, blah, I had, blah, a, so, had, had a couple of experiences like that where it at the lunchtime, this is we're going out on a golf course. They looked at me and said, uh, Tom, what's in that box? I, that's a water flow test kit. I said, uh, we're, we're going to go out and pump the rig this afternoon. I said, I don't play golf. I don't caddy. So uh, <laughs> you want, want to take them? I said, we're uh, we're rolling. Chief Lasky, it's, it's been it's been an honor and a pleasure to uh, to, to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to ring in with yourself and Chief Salker. Oh, it's, you know, uh, John had to step out for a moment to check on something. Uh, but I know he was, you know, we, we're always talking. Uh, like I said, we don't have a script. We don't have an agenda. We go, hey, what do you want to talk about? And we'll t- usually it's like we we pull up and go, we both look at each other and go, what do you want to talk about? He'll go, uh, let's talk Venn or Search. Okay, you ready? I press record and off we go. And just with the fact that, you know, they just bought a new engine for South Blooming Grove and we've been other places, the whole final, the, the whole process we talked about, but that really came in and he started talking about you, Tom, and he goes, and it, it just the other day, he goes, we got to get Tom on. We got to get Tom on for a show. Let's yeah, get Tom I, on I, for I, a show. But when, when, I, when, when I got the invitation the other day, I was at the funeral. I said, well, I, I, I kind of know what prompted this. I, I really feel bad for Chief Salka for everything that he's put in his heart and soul into that department to have people just think that they can, uh, you know, but again, it just, everybody has different perspectives or I guess different expectations, you know, yeah. uh, uh, one quick little uh, story. So many, many years ago, it's when uh, uh, Gordon Routley was assistant to the fire chief in Phoenix. And I was in the apparatus industry working for Salisbury. And we had done a really weird uh, tandem axle mid engine rescue truck with a crane and we were working to try to get them to look at some of our designs on engine apparatus and they were a hundred percent e1 with the hush with the rear engine fleet and i didn't think there was much of a chance of uh doing that i was much younger so gordon set me up to ride with uh paramedic engine 18 they were the busiest engine all right so i mean we did innumerable ems calls i i think we only ran one actual two-in-one assignment you know, never, never saw any lines being pulled and everything, but it was, was interesting group. So I'm asking their engineer uh, on this rig 
what he likes and doesn't like. And because I'm like a pocket protector nerd chief, I'm thinking we're, he's going to tell me something about the pump controls or hose lines or something. And he looks at me. And at the time I was in my early forties, he goes, kid, three things important on this fire truck. One good refrigeration. He was referring to the air conditioning. Who is a comfortable seat, not just for me, but for the rest of the crew, he says, because we spend the better part of our day just riding around in this thing. The third thing says probably more important than the than the refrigeration, big ass cup holders. And with that, <laughs> he's got one of these sixty four ounce big gulp things that everybody in the station had and took it with them religiously. You know, the rig, the, the gear was already on the rig. <laughs> Bruno had long since pulled out the SCBAs and they were sitting in compartments. So those were the three most important things on a Phoenix fire truck. I told Gordon that I said, I had my notepad out ready to like, oh man, this guy's going to, he's going to whip some knowledge. <laughs> All right. And those, those were the three most important things on a Phoenix fire truck. I'm like, well, I, I was thinking, well, I, you know, I'm thinking just about any fire truck builder could probably do that. <laughs> Not too sophisticated. <laughs> well, if they if they want to get a hold of you, um, they want to get a hold of you. I know we talked about Mike earlier, uh, our good friend Mike Wilbur. But uh, if somebody says, you know what? Now I'm now I'm really all hoodooed on this. Now that I heard you talk about all this stuff, uh, if they want to get a hold of you to contract you to have you come out to do whatever, to whether it's uh, apparatus operations, um, all the different things that go with, with our rigs. Not just, it's like fire apparatus, general fire engineering. People think it's just apparatus. It's everything firehouse that goes into the firehouse, including the rigs, tools, exhaust systems, so on and so forth. And that um, if they want to get a hold of you, uh, to yeah, have you help them, probably, what would it be? Uh, probably the best way. Our, our website is all lowercase, all together, emergency vehicle response.com is a spot there on the website. You can put in information with your, your, your contact information and what you're interested in. Through the magic of the internet, when you hit send, that goes to four of us automatically. All right. And depending upon whose area of expertise that is, we'll do our very best generally to get back in touch with you with, within a day. And uh, we'll see, you know, where, where we can where we can help you out. Uh, well, I want to emphasize for, for Mike and I in particular, uh, as we're in uh, Mike's fa famous expression is we're, we're at the tail end of a mediocre career. Uh, we're out to try to help as many folks as we can to pass on the information. Uh, I designed a lot of fire trucks that all fit on 11 by 17 pieces of paper myself. Just about every one I thought at the beginning was pretty good. Some of them didn't turn, turn out that well, you know, when you look at the end result. Hope, hopefully more often than not, at least, you know, we we, we not got the ball out of the infield, at least got a single. But we're, we're here to help sustain the fire service with people that are that are into our little niche in the world of, of 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 fire trucks. If we can if we can help somebody to help uh, get them out of a jam, uh, to help save a life, uh, Mike has done yeoman work with uh, uh, folks that have had you know not non fatal but very tragic apparatus accidents. You know to help them to say okay here's here's. You know, we're, we're not here to, to diagnose like a police agency, you know, had the accident happen. But here's what was on the rig and you want to make sure you don't do that again. Or from a training perspective, here's some things you can do. So anything that we can do to help the folks, uh, you, you get on the website, you put in your contact information. We'll do the best we can. to if And if we don't know, uh, we'll, 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 we'll point you in, in the right direction. But uh, Chief Lasky and Chief Salka, to, to be asked to be invited to be on this podcast, this is just absolutely great. I really appreciate the opportunity to share information. And for any of your listeners, uh, don't think uh, that if you put something in there, you, you get you get a bill. I mean, we're, we're here to help folks. If there's something you think we need our services and we need to go to a contract, an agreement, we do that. If it's something we can we can help you out with to get you out of a jam, to answer a question, to maybe help, uh, as I call it, uh, calm the waters a little bit with your committee and get everybody uh, back on a boat and rowing in the same direction, we'll, we're happy to do that as well. Perfect. Go ahead, John. Oh, hang on a second, buddy. Unmute. How about there now? Good? 
Yeah, you're good now. All right. I, I need to add something because I've known Mike for decades and, and, and Tom as well. I've known both of these uh, men for a long time. And I, I think it probably came up a couple of times in this in this podcast, uh, the, the unique work that they do. They, they do unique work on on an issue and on issues that are at the very best vaguely familiar to most of the people that are dealing with them from fire chiefs to commissioners to firefighters to truck committees even maybe with the exception of people that have the big the big fleets but everybody else there's 40,000 fire departments and most folks it's a big big challenge it's something new something that hasn't been done in 10 years they're getting a new rig they're specking a new rig even if they're buying a used rig you know what i'm saying the the technical expertise that both tom and and Mike have and and the rest of the crew that they have they have some other fo- other folks working with them now too uh the technical expertise that they have is going to make what could be a very trying and challenging and maybe maybe not so successful um operation you know activity they can make it a really good successful uh you know purchase of of a vehicle or a final inspection of a vehicle so i i just have to reiterate and it's not because i know them and love them they're both great guys you're not going to find two better guys, right? Salt of the earth. But they're so good at what they do. And everyone else in the country is so clueless about that topic that, that it's just a natural, it's just a natural attraction to, to get these guys. I, as I said, I know there's other guys that are probably doing, doing similar work, but, but, but these folks right here, Tom and, and, and Mike do such a great job that you feel good about it. And, and we just went through it. My, my, my volunteer fire department, Tom worked with us for a long time and, and, Every time he opened his mouth, something else came out that all of us went, did you know that? Did you know that? And it's just it's just absolutely amazing. So if you do have any questions or if you are considering buying a rig, even thinking about buying a rig, you know what? Call them up, and they're going to give you advice on, oh, good, good. You didn't even start yet? Great. Here's the first thing you should do. Here's the second thing you should do. And uh, and, and that's it. I could go on and on and on, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Thanks, well, Tom. And there's, there's no ego uh, there. I, we started off by – and when we introduced uh, – to our listeners right now, we introduced Tom in the beginning. We talked about uh, another person who is, uh, you know, a difference maker in the fire service. And that's what you guys do. Um, uh, you're difference makers. You're having an impact on the fire service. So, you know what? Reach out to them. Ask your questions. Um, you know, and again, I'll take it. If you go to the website, you realize there's more than just spec and rigs all the way, you know, from design to acceptance, they do a lot more than that when it comes to apparatus operations and safety and things and so on and so forth, um, you know, to go there. So, uh, Tom, can't, can't thank you enough. Uh, appreciate you. John, if they want to get a hold of you, best uh, best email? John Salka. Is that what it is? Chief John, <laughs> Chief John Chief. Salka at gmail.com. Chief John Salka. I know we haven't done with these in a while. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. Hey, in closing, folks, we always ask you, uh, and Tom, hang on there with us before when we sign off. Uh, in closing, we always ask, please keep the men and women armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember this, please, never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Be safe, God bless you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> 